Uh, the scripture reading this morning is from Luke 18, 18 through 30. It might be a familiar passage for you. Uh, it's the story of the rich young ruler. And this morning we're going to have Sai Malki come up and he's going to read the scripture for us this morning. So if you would please stand and face the center of the room because we believe that the word of God is at the center of everything that we do. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these things I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to start off with a fun pop culture quiz this morning, so get excited. Uh, in the last service, uh, uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to read a quote from a movie, and you have to tell me what actor said that quote and from what movie. My wife was in the last service and totally cheated, so no cheating this time. So I'm going to read a quote to you and tell me who it is and from what movie, and if you can do it. Good for you if you can't have like eight more quotes. We can just go all day. So here it is. But oh, to be free, not to have to go poof. What do you need? Poof. What do you need? Poof. What do you need? To be my own master. Such a thing would be greater than all the magic and all the treasures in the world. But what am I talking about? Let's get real here. It's not going to happen. Jeannie, wake up and smell the hummus. What movie? Who's the actor? Man, you guys are way too good for this. I'm never doing a quiz with you ever again. It's not fair. Robin Williams. Um, it, when I was a kid, he was easily one of my favorite comedic actors. I can still remember him dressed up as an old, overweight woman with lots of makeup on taking care of his children. And he was one of those comedians, though, that he'd be hilarious, and then suddenly it would get really serious, and it would hit you right in the heart, and you'd, you couldn't help but maybe tear up a little bit. I don't know if, if that's you. If you weren't aware, a, a year ago, uh, Robin Williams sadly ended his life, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, what I want to spend a lot of time on this morning is what the media did uh, to kind of deal with what happened to Robin Williams, because I find it very, very interesting. The media asked a lot of questions. How could someone as wildly successful and uh, iconic as Robin Williams do such a thing? And there were all sorts of opinions out there everywhere. There was also the great tribute movies, which I watched like Probably all of them. I don't know about you. But a couple of months after the funeral, the New York Times wrote an, uh, an op-ed explaining what they thought really happened to Robin Williams. And I'd like to read just a short snippet of that for you. This is what the author said. He said, Life events can trigger a downward episode. And Williams, as an artist, was highly sensitive to nuances of success or failure and the accelerated cycles of those two sides in the 21st century. He once said he heard a little voice saying, you're garbage, you're nothing. He did a riff 
comic with a ring of haunting truth about his GPS steering him over the Golden Gate Bridge. And when the author asked him why he said something like that, he said, haven't you seen my movies lately? It's kind of depressing, right? What I see and what this author sees is that Robin Williams tied his worth to his performance. He tied his worth to what his audience thought of him. If he was liked by viewers, and at the beginning of, the, of his career, if you ever tracked him, he was loved by his viewers. He had a high sense of steam life, sense of self-esteem, and he was excited about life. But then whenever he had, went through a slew of bad movies, and if you ever followed his career, he went through a slew of really bad movies. Depression struck. A feeling of absolute worthlessness. And I wonder if for you and for me this morning, if we also have a self-worth issue. I wonder if many of us are highly sensitive to personal criticisms. If someone criticizes your work performance, your self-worth plummets. If someone, and I've, I've learned my lesson from this, but if someone walks up to a woman and asks if they're pregnant, don't do that, especially men, and then they're not pregnant, what happens to the woman? Self-worth plummets. Or if you're like me, and you value being intelligent and smart, and someone says you're dumb, what does that do to your self-worth? I think that the rich young ruler in our passage this morning had a self-worth issue just like Robin Williams. And I also think that what Jesus said to him, though he walked away sad, gives us a good understanding of how we measure our worth in life, but also how God, through Jesus, provides us a permanent solution to our quest for self-worth. So what I would really like us to do this morning is to open our ears and listen in close to this famous story of the rich young ruler. Now, before we do that, I realize probably all of us have forgotten the story, including myself. I'm just kidding, I didn't forget the story. That'd be bad. And we have kids here this morning that might want to see a different version of this story told, and we have just a quick kids video to kind of recap the story. So check out this video. One day, Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Jerusalem. A rich young leader came running to Jesus. He got down on his knees and asked Jesus a question. Good teacher, what do I need to do to live with you forever in heaven when I die? Good teacher, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. I believe you are from God, teacher. Hmm. Well, to answer your question, you know the Ten Commandments, right? You must not murder. You must not be unfaithful to your wife. You must not steal. You must not tell lies. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Oh yes, teacher. I've obeyed all these commandments since I was a kid. Is that all? Jesus looked at the man with a smile. He loved this young man. Jesus really wanted this man to follow him and could see what was holding him back. Well then, there's still one thing you haven't done. Go and sell everything you own, and give your money to the poor, so you will have treasure in heaven. Then, I want you to come follow me and be one of my disciples. When the man heard this, his face fell. Instead of saying yes to Jesus' offer, he walked away, feeling sad. He didn't want to give up his stuff. It would be easier for a camel to walk through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. You can't get there holding on to the things you love here on earth. You have to let go of the things on earth to grab on to the things of heaven. The disciples wondered, who in the world could be saved then? Isn't that too hard for anyone to do? With your own human strength, it is impossible. But with God's strength, everything is possible. Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, said, 
We've given up everything to follow you, Jesus. Yes, you have. And I promise you that everyone who has given up everything to follow me and spread the good news will receive a reward a hundred times better. In life on earth, you'll face hard times and suffering, but you'll get eternal life. Those who are the greatest now will be the least important then. Those who seem the least important now will be the greatest in heaven. There we go. Sermon finished. See you next week. That was a bad joke, and you laughed. Okay. So the rich young ruler. So it's the rich young ruler is this guy, right? He walks up. He's, he's the quintessential human, right? He's the guy that's got the car. He's got the money. He's got the mansion on the hill. He's got the girl. And he's got the impeccable moral record to go with it. He is an all-star in the world, right? If we were to see this guy walking around today, we might be an incy wincy bit jealous and maybe want to be him. Yet, in all of his greatness that he has, and all the things that he has, and all the things he's maybe achieved, he still has a question. And this is his question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if you're familiar with this story from the Bible, and, and many of you probably are, the rich young ruler often is painted as kind of a villain. Because if you've ever read the Gospels, there's these Pharisees that were walking around always testing Jesus. They'd walk up to Jesus and ask him a question and try to catch him, try to catch him off guard, try to get him to say the wrong thing so they could bust him. That is not what the rich young ruler is doing. The rich young ruler is a good Jewish man asking a question that all Jewish people would have asked in that day. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And that question for Judaism was a really big question. Jewish people in Jesus' day, and even some today, are very concerned with their performance before God. They're very concerned that they follow God's law perfectly, the Ten Commandments, if you want to think about it that way. And even more than that, if you've ever been to even a, a Jewish synagogue today, the way that they do worship is very particular because they want to make sure that they're doing things right before God. In, in Jesus' day, it was actually even more incredible than we can imagine, really. Check out Matthew 23, 23. This is Jesus talking to the Pharisees, and I don't, want to, I don't want you to see him yelling at the Pharisees. I want you to see the last half, and he says, You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. I'm hoping that many of you this morning brought your tenth of spices to tithe. That's a joke. You didn't. It's weird. Who would do that? If, if you walked... If you walked into your kitchen and, and you were like, all right, I have to tithe, and you walk in, you grab your spices, and you get out like a little utensil or something to try to, it's like, all right, here's basil. We have one leaf for God and then nine leaves. It would take all day. But they took this very seriously, so seriously that maybe today we see it as a little strange. But there's a reason they took it seriously. And to understand why Jews were so concerned about their performance, we have to go back to the book of Genesis, to this famous covenant between God and Abram in Genesis 12. Let me read that covenant to you now. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This Jewish covenant, is, it's a big promise from God. That one day God was going to take this Abram person, and he was going to have kids. And I don't know if you know the story, but Abram and his wife couldn't have kids. And God was going to make them have kids, and he was going to give them this great land. And eventually he was going to make them a great nation, and God was going to orchestrate all of that. 
But the covenant had conditions too. And if you kind of move a little forward in your Bible to the book of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 28, you see something, they call it the blessings and the curses of, of the law, of the covenant that God made with Abram. And here's just the front end of it. It's really long. It's really interesting if you want to read it later. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commandments, if you fully obey the Lord your God and follow all his commandments, I give you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. But if Abram and his descendants chose not to do that, horrible things would happen to them. And they call those the curses of the law. And these are some of the things that would happen to them. I have a little bit on the screen for you. This is just a little, a little exciting tidbit for you. You will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. Your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed in the crops of your land and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. You will be cursed when you walk in and you will be cursed when you come out. And the biggest curse of all, if you were a Jewish person, was the curse that one day the land that God gave the Jewish people, God would take back. And if you know how the story goes in the Bible, that's basically exactly what happens, right? In, in the center of your Bible, there's something, there's a big grouping of books called the prophets. And the prophets often, are, they're basically yelling at the Jews the whole time, like, get, get, get it together, get it together, guys. And if you read what the prophets say about the Jews, they literally went through the Ten Commandments and they checked off everyone, yep, we broke all of those. But there was also a promise to the covenant that even if Abram and his descendants should fail and be cast out of the land, God would one day bring them back into the land. And in the Bible, it's often referred to as the day of the Lord, or Jesus called it the kingdom of God. And the way folks got to be a part of that future when God would put everything back together and all things would be made right was by making sure that you followed the law and you followed it perfectly. Does that make sense? So when the, when the rich young ruler asked Jesus, what do I do to inherit eternal life? What he's really asking, if you look at the context, is am I following the Jewish law so perfectly that God sees me as a worthy person so one day I can be part of God's future kingdom? Am I living a worthy life before God. Does God see me as worthy? I wonder if for you and for me, if we also are asking that question in our lives. What must I do to inherit eternal life? How can I be deemed worthy before my family and my friends and my acquaintances and ultimately before God. And I wonder if the whole trajectory of our lives is guided by our pursuit of being worthy to the world before God. I wonder if we work, and I know many of you do, you work so hard and you do that so that you can maintain some sense of worth that you have. I wonder if some of you eat the way you do so you can try to maintain something with your body so that you're, you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, okay, I'm worthy. Or I wonder if, if you exercise like my wife and her crazy friends from TFRC that get up at 5 a.m. to do this. I wonder if they exercise the way they do. I wonder if people do that to make sure that they're worthy. The question for us this morning is, what strategy are you and I employing to attempt to make ourselves worthy? What's your strategy? Let me rephrase that. What does the best, most worthy version of yourself look like 
And how are you trying to get there in your life? As I've spent some time thinking about this, I really think there's, there's two ways that we as, as folks from Twin Falls or even just Americans in general try to do this, try to be worthy in our lives. And I can think of two. And the first is through self-reliance. And what I mean by that is we believe that our worth is essentially self-made. Our worth is contingent upon what we do in our lives. And so because of that, we make all kinds of decisions in our lives to maintain our worth, right? We gain power. We gain as much power as we can because the more power, the more worthy. We make sure that we strategically find relationships so that we're friends with the right people in the right places so we can make sure that we remain worthy. Achievements. Or perhaps for you, if you're kind of at the second half of life, it's legacy. You want to make sure that after you're gone, you have this legacy where people look upon your life and your achievements and say, that guy was worthy, that girl was worthy. And if we're honest with ourselves, if you think about this, it's really the American dream, right? The harder we work, the more worthy we are. We look at people in our society, and if they're not working, if they're unemployed, we often look down upon them as lesser. Is that fair? Self-reliance is ultimately what I would call an atheistic view of the world. It's a godless view because God is not needed. The only thing that really matters is what you and I do in our lives to make sure that we are worthy. The second is religion. Hmm? God is the giver of worth in religion, right? Some people turn to religion. God is the giver of worth, but... The only way that God grants any worth to us in our entire lives is by us living up to some kind of standard that God sets, right? So we might become moralistic. We have really high morals in our lives and we project those morals on everyone else. We have to make sure that our, our view of God, our doctrine is perfect. Anything to not upset God. The rich young ruler, he would probably ascribe to this one. The thing that self-reliance and religion have in common is that worth is ultimately on our behavior. It's what we do. It's what we accomplish. And at the end of the day, there's a problem with that. Because those things that we pursue, whether it's our self-reliance or it's our religion, ultimately will break down on us. With the self-reliant person eventually their work will end and all of their identity and worth that they have built into their job or their career will be gone. If they've put all their worth in money, that money will go away at some point. If you've put your time into power, the more power I have, the more worthy. When you get to the end of your life and you're laying on your deathbed, you're not going to feel very powerful. And eventually your legacy if that's what it's all about for you, will be forgotten. And then with the religious, the other side, right? The religious will eventually have to come face to face with the fact that they can never live up to God's high standards and they will continually let God down over and over and over again until they have to admit that it's too hard and they're just not worthy. My question for you this morning is do you identify with either of these strategies in your life? Do you see it at play? Some of you might be asking, and this is exactly what the crowd asked Jesus when the, he spoke to the rich young ruler. The crowd said, well then, well then who can be saved? And what Jesus says, his response, I find to be absolutely fascinating. He says, what is impossible with man is possible possible with God. What we struggle to do and we can't achieve and we can't achieve and we can't achieve, God can. 
You know, what the self-reliant people think, right? That's their strategy. What they ultimately believe is that self-worth can be earned by what they accomplish. And what the religious people believe is that self-worth is earned only by appeasing God. But Jesus says something different. The point for Jesus is that our worth is not determined by ourselves or by our performance before God. It is only God and God's performance that makes you worthy. And we can't even influence that. In fact, when our behavior is absolutely at its worst, when we have failed utterly and completely, when our sense of self-worth is just totally at the floor, we still have a God who says, you're worthy. And as Christians, we have proof. And that proof is on the cross. That in our most unworthy state as people, when we were at the exact bottom, when we had fled from God, when we had failed God and failed ourselves, we have a Jesus who comes to this earth and hangs on a cross so God can say, you are worthy to me. And so if you really want to know what it's like to be worthy... You must accept Jesus and the cross for what they are, a gift. And ultimately, that's really what turned the rich young ruler off and he couldn't do it because he had so much to lose. He had the perfect life. He had it nailed. He was doing it. And to give all that up just to receive something from God was too risky. And I wonder if for you... And for me this morning, what do we have to give up so that we can more fully embrace the gracious acceptance and worth that we can get from God through Jesus on the cross? We must learn to stop doing and to start receiving. Hmm? You know, the past couple days have been really interesting for me because I've had several conversations with folks that have had very similar stories. And this is what their story kind of sounds like to me. The story is, I've been trying to please God so hard. And these are people in our church. So hard. And I keep failing and failing and failing and I am exhausted. I don't know if I can do it anymore. Is that you? Friends, The only way you're going to find rest is in God. In God's verdict that you're worthy. So you don't have to strive so hard to find it somewhere else. And you don't have to perform for God or for others to find worth. You only have to find it on the cross. Stop trying to do what you can to be worthy and accept the cross for simply what it is. Amen?